In the shadow of the last great Colosseum, an idea was formed to showcase boxers the world over who were looking for nothing more than opportunity. This idea birthed what would be known as the World Boxing Federation, a global institution that, for decades, has seen prominence in the sweet science, and its origins began in East Tennessee. Larry Carrier was the founder and owner of Bristol Motor Speedway and the International Hot Rod Association back in the 60s. He was a big boxing fan and he was an amateur boxer himself. And I was an amateur uh, boxing kid from Elizabeth and my dad had a gym. So I grew up in the sport and I started um, attending Mr. Carrier's Budweiser Saturday Night Fights at the Bristol Sports Arena and uh, just so happened he had an opening for a public relations guy at the uh, racetrack, and I ended up there, and at the same time got the opportunity to help him promote boxing at the sports arena, which I have to say now, and I can say now, that I preferred promoting boxing more than I did NASCAR racing. I just had a love for boxing and still do. It was the duo of Larry Carrier and Ron Scalf that would kickstart a new governing body in boxing the foundation of which was built on a common need they saw in fighters across East Tennessee. There were boxing clubs in every community during that period of time back in the 80s and 90s, and there was a lot of activity going on. We discovered that the other sanctioning bodies, these kids weren't getting a chance for whatever reason, so we thought that we would uh, take it upon ourselves and start our own sanctioning body, which Mr. Carrier knew a lot about sanctioning bodies with drag racing and with NASCAR. After throwing around a few prototypical names for the fledgling organization, Carrier and Scalf settled on a name at a Hardee's near the Bristol Motor Speedway. And we went through some alphabet soup type of things. Finally, I said, has anybody got a WBF? And Larry looked at me and said, no, I've never heard of that. And I said, well, why don't we start the World Boxing Federation? He said, well, you need to go tomorrow to our law, or to our attorney, and research that and make sure that it's not taken. And it wasn't, so we copy wrote that name the next day in half the states and three foreign countries just to be on the safe side. And that's how the WBF started, on the back of a napkin. Carrier would own the WBF while Scalf would be president. In addition to using regional talent, the two scouted other avenues for potential WBF pugilists, like local tough man contests. In those events, I always had my eye out for talent that might end up being a professional boxer. So part of it was to do the event, but a lot of it was just see if there's actually um, some up-and-coming boxers, and we found a couple of them, actually. With plenty of fighters in their stable, the World Boxing Federation held its first event in the summer of 1988. The first WBF card was held in Bristol at the Armory. I think it was 120 degrees that day because if we'd had a couple more people, we'd had enough for a card game because nobody showed up. So we kind of learned from that too. And never sanction or sponsor an event, especially boxing, when the University of Tennessee is playing football, I found that out too. You don't do that. With the first show under its belt, it was off to the races for the WBF. They slowly but surely expanded their reach over the next two years. I lived in my car. I drove to many states to try to set up our organization. And actually, I started after that hiring field representatives that would actually represent us because... Me and Mr. Carrier can't be everywhere, and we're doing 20 or 30 shows at a time. So it was like a, a lot of, um, I guess, grassroots thing you would do with starting any business. The thing about the WBF, it was never about money. It wasn't about million-dollar purses. It was more about recognition, and that's how we got so many promotions because we were, A, affordable, local kids, whether you're in Brazil or Germany, or in Wheeling, West Virginia, it's an opportunity that you're going to have that you probably are not going to get with anybody else. In 1990, after dozens of WBF shows, a world championship title belt was created to honor the fighters worthy of claiming the crown. Just because we were, say, a lower statue sanctioning body in boxing, I didn't want to skimp on the belt is the most important thing 
that you present. Um, and I just loved going, especially on TV um, shows, raising that belt because it's actually beautiful. The first World Boxing Federation Championship match happened on December 7, 1990 at the Target Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Young Joe Lewis took on former IBF cruiserweight champion and Morristown, Tennessee native Ricky Parkey for the WBF cruiserweight title. It really illuminated the WBF's philosophy of giving up and coming boxers and even boxers that had gotten a chance that were on their way down might get one more shot. And to be quite honest, Ricky Parkey was a favorite of ours and he was a good boxer, had a great record and sold himself on that show in Minneapolis because they knew who he was too. Young Joe Lewis just happened to get on the card as a late substitute, but he had had so many fights, it was like, it wasn't an embarrassment to put him up against Ricky Parkey, but Ricky was just so much better than he was and just pretty much destroyed him in the end. The World Boxing Federation soon had champions across all of boxing's weight classes and expanded its reach worldwide. The following year, we ended up sanctioning championship fights in 28 states and 30 foreign countries. It just was a wildfire. Regionally, we would say be in Bangkok, Thailand, and the local NBC affiliate or what have you, and Thailand would pick that show up. So before we knew it, we were starting to become known internationally from Australia to South Africa, where we were doing events, Germany, Spain, Portugal. Yeah, it became very, um, very popular really quick, I might say. In 1991, the WBF even honored the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, at the site where he won his first World Heavyweight Championship in 1964. We did go to Miami and worked with a city to name the Miami Arena after Muhammad Ali, and he came to a World Boxing Federation show where we dedicated the hall to him, and he sat ringside, and that was a thrill. At the peak of its popularity, World Boxing Federation championship matches were held on the most prestigious of boxing cards. I think it was eye-opening when people start seeing us on television as much as we were. I mean, we were doing HBO shows. I'm sitting next to George Foreman. My favorite boxing story is during the commercial. And Jim Lampley was in the floor after I asked him this. I said, hey, champ, how you get one of those grills? You know? And George Foreman looks at me and says, Ron, they sell them at Sears. In June of 1998, a decade after the company began, WBF owner Larry Carrier sold the company to President Ron Scalf. He just got to the point in his life he wanted to spend more time with his, his two sons, and it had got built up to the point that it was a very great business concern, and he just felt like that with our relationship over 15 years that he wanted to sell it to me versus uh, continuing on. The WBF pushed forward without Carrier, and on March 27, 2001, Ron Scalf was quoted as saying, it's our biggest day since we started in 1988. During all these years, we were, we were not trying to get marquee names. Roy Jones, I was calling him to try to get some of, he also had associations with other boxers in his gym, and I was after them to fight for the WBF. I had no belief or dream Roy Jones would ever box for us. And he invited me to come down to Florida to a, a luncheon and accepted the WBF belt and told me that our organization and that belt meant as much to him as the other ones. And when he fought, he was fighting for all the belts, including ours. And after that, I would go to all of his shows and I was in the ring presenting our belt to him just like the other organization, which was a great thrill. And it also was a big shot in the arm because uh, there you are, you know, ringside on HBO with Roy Jones Jr. and he's a WBF champion. Jones wasn't the only marquee name to hold a WBF championship. Numerous Hall of Famers and all-time greats would have the distinction of being a WBF champion. Evander Holyfield was our heavyweight champion at a time. Oddly Harrison, who's from London, England, who won the gold medal in the Olympics. The World Boxing Federation maintained until 2003 when a lawsuit by former WBF Cruiserweight champion Bash Ali threatened the close Scouse organization for good. 
We have a rule, and most sanctioning bodies do, that if you're a champion and you don't defend your title, we have the right to call the title vacant because the whole th idea about the sanctioning body is activity and giving people opportunity. So we had a boxer from Nigeria that that happened to, and he hadn't, de he hadn't defended his title in a year and a half. Then we had an opportunity come up for that particular weight class in Manchester, England, and I supported the vacancy, and I s supported sanctioning that event. So a few weeks later, we had a new cruiserweight title. According to UK newspaper The Daily Telegraph, Bash Ali had a scheduled WBF cruiserweight championship fight against Terry Ray in Nigeria in 1999. The fight was postponed until September 2000. Ali won, becoming champion. He would not fight again until November 2001, 14 months later. The Daily Telegraph reported Ali claimed he was asked to cover Ray's purse and other sums by the WBF in order to keep his number one contender status during the postponement. Also according to the paper, after Ali won the championship, he was asked to pay almost 10,000 pounds to be recognized as champion on the WBF website. The article claimed Ali was stripped of his championship three months after winning it over the telephone. Scalf maintains that Ali's claims in the Daily Telegraph are false and that Ali was stripped of his championship strictly due to his inactivity. And unfortunately, we were sued or called into question about that rule in Oakland, California, and there was a hearing, and I showed up and gave our side of the story. And for whatever the reason, the judge sided with the boxer. Um, and I told the judge, well, I'd be happy to take his rule and reinstate him if that's what it is, but they had damages in the excess of a million dollars, and the WBF wasn't, it wasn't all about making money, like I said before. So I just bankrupt the organization as a business uh, decision. It was a, that was a sad de demise. I think maybe if there was any good come out of that, is I had 15 years of being involved in that sport. The original incarnation of the World Boxing Federation ran from 1988 to 2003. Almost as soon as it closed, a new WBF, the World Boxing Foundation, took its place. No longer headquartered in Bristol, the new WBF would find its home in England under President Jonathan Feld. The World Boxing Foundation changed hands to Mike Croucher in 2004, who based the company in Australia. Both the World Boxing Foundation and Croucher are still active and holding shows to this day. In 2009, the World Boxing Federation of Old was reestablished. Both the Foundation and Federation claim their lineage began with Carrier and Scalf's WBF. Scalf himself was instrumental in getting the new World Boxing Federation off the ground. They had actually called me when they wanted to resurrect the WBF and told me what their plans were. And they actually wanted me to come on board with them uh, which I told them I would do, and I did for about six months in an advisory capacity. So we went from Bristol, Tennessee to Luxembourg uh, 20 years later. Although he was out of boxing for years, Scalf fondly remembers his time with the WBF. Being a boxing fan, too, it's not so much a fight, it's a happening, you know, and I always enjoyed going to shows and seeing movie stars and um, Barry Bonds sit next to me at, a fight in Portland, Oregon one time, and you know, just to see those people. And, uh, and Don King's hair is real. I've been with him a few times too, but, but just characters and just, uh, but I never looked at it as a job. I thought I had the greatest job around, to jump in planes and fly all over the world and watch boxing shows. I think mo most of all, the people that I got to meet, Angelo Dundee became like one of my best friends, and he would actually, defend the WBF and he actually worked some of the uh, corners of some of our fights and he actually came to Bristol, Tennessee. From Bristol to the big time, Larry Carrier, Ron Scalf and the WBF left an indelible mark on the sport of boxing and it all started inside of a Hardee's in East Tennessee on the back of a napkin. I would say Larry Carrier was my second father if you will. Larry Carrier gave me every opportunity that a little boy from Elizabethan, Tennessee would have never got the opportunity, and he made it happen. 
and he made it happen to the point that he gave me the WBF because I think he recognized our relationship and he wanted me to carry on his legacy as well. Yeah, I hope in some small way I help bring events to communities also. There's a lot of small towns in these foreign countries that got to host a WBF show because we made it easy, we made it affordable. We got the local community involved, the local officials. We also made sure on the undercard that it was local kids. So they got to be a part of a championship show that was nationally televised. It wasn't about money, it wasn't about building some arena somewhere, but it's um, hopefully there's champions all over the world that have their belt on their mantle and remember what I helped them try to do.